fairy gifts. It generally happens that people's surroundings reflect more or less accuracy their minds and dispositions. So perhaps that is why the flower fairy lived in a lovely palace with the most delightful garden you can imagine, full of flowers and trees and fountains and fish ponds and, you know, everything nice. For the flower fairy herself was so kind and charming that everybody loved her, and all the young princesses and princes who formed her court were as happy as the day was long, simply because they were near her. They came to her when they were quite tiny, and never left her until they were grown up, and had to go away into the great world. And when that time came, she gave to each whatever gift he asked of her. But it was chiefly of Princess Sylvia that you are going to hear now. The fairy loved her with all her heart, for she was at once original and gentle, and she had nearly reached the age at which the gifts were generally bestowed. However, the fairy had a great wish to know how the other princesses had grown up and when they left her prospering. Before the time came for Sylvia to go herself, she resolved to send her to some of them. So, one day her chariot, drawn by butterflies, was made ready, and the fairy said, Sylvia, I am going to send you to the court of the Iris. She will receive you with pleasure for my sake, and as well as for your own. In two months you may come back to me again, and I shall expect you to tell me what you think of her. Sylvia was very unwilling to go away, but as the fairy wished it, she said nothing. Only when two months were over, she stepped joyfully into the butterfly chariot and did not get back quickly enough to the flower fairy, who, for her part, was equally delighted to see her again. Now, child, she said, tell me what impression you have received. You sent me, madam answered Sylvia, to the court of Iris, on whom you had bestowed the gift of beauty. She never tells anyone, however, that it was your gift, though she often speaks of your kindness in general. It seemed to me that her loveliness, which fairly dazed me at first, <clears throat> had absolutely deprived her of any use of her other gifts or graces. In allowing herself to be seen, she appeared to think that she was doing all that possibly could be required of her. But unfortunately, while I was still with her, she became seriously ill, and though she presently recovered, her beauty is entirely gone, so that she hates the very sight of herself and is in despair. She entreated me to tell you what happened, and to beg you, in pity, to give her beauty back to her. And indeed, she, she does need it terribly, for all the things in her that were tolerable, or even agreeable, when she was so pretty, seem quite different now that she is ugly. And it is so long since she thought of using her mind or her natural cleverness, that I really don't think she has any left now. She is quite aware of all this herself, so you may imagine how unhappy she is, or how earnestly she begs you for your aid. You have told me what I wanted to know, cried the fairy, but alas, I cannot help her. My gifts can be given, but only once. Some time passed in all the usual delights of the flower fairy's palace, and then she sent for Sylvia again, and told her she was to stay for a little while with Princess Daphne. And accordingly the butterflies whisked her off, and set her quite down quite in a strange kingdom. But she had only been there for a very little time before wandering butterfly brought a message from her to the fairy, begging that she might be sent for as soon as possible. And before long, she was allowed to return Oh, madam, she cried, what a place you have sent me to that time. Why, what was the matter? asked the fairy. 
Daphne was one of the princesses who asked for a gift of eloquence, if I remember correctly. And very ill the gift of eloquence becomes a woman, replied Sylvia with an air of conviction. It is so true that she speaks well, but her expressions are well chosen. But then she never leaves off talking. And though the first one may be amused, one ends by being wearied to death. Above all things, she loves any assembly for setting the affairs of the kingdom. For on those occasions, she can talk and talk and talk without fear of interruption. But then, the moment is over, she is ready to begin again without anything or nothing, as this case may be. Oh, how glad I was to come away, I cannot tell you. The fairy smiled at Sylvia's unfeigned disgust at her last experience. But after allowing her a little time to recover, she sent her to the court of Princess Cynthia, where she was left for three months. At the end of this time, Sylvia came back to her with all the joy and contentment that one feels once more being beside her dear friend. The fairy as usual, was anxious to hear what she saw, thought of Cynthia, who had always been amiable, and to whom she had given the gift of pleasing. I thought at first, said Sylvia, that she must be the happiest princess in the world. She had a thousand lovers who vied with one another over their efforts to please and gratify her. Indeed, I nearly decided what I should ask a similar gift. Have you altered your mind, then? interrupted the fairy. Yes, indeed, madam, replied Sylvia, and I will tell you why. The longer I stayed, the more I saw that Cynthia was not really happy. In her desire to please everyone, she ceased to be sincere, and she generated into a mere coquette. And even her lovers felt that the charms and fascinations were exercised upon all who approached her without distinction, and were valueless so that then in the end they ceased to care for them, and went away disdainfully. I am pleased with you, child, said the fairy. Enjoy yourself here for a while, and presently you shall go to Philadelphia. Sylvia was glad to have leisure to think, for she could not make up her mind at all what she should ask for herself, and the time was drawing very near. However, before long, the fairy sent, for Phil sent her to Philia, and waited for her report with unabated interest. I reached her court safely, said Sylvia, and she received me with much kindness and immediately began to exercise upon me the brilliant wit which you had bestowed upon her. I confess that I was a little fascinated by it, and for a week thought it was nothing could be more desirable. The time passed like magic. So great was the charm of her society. But I ended by ceasing to covet that gift more than any of the others I had seen before. For, like the gift of pleasing, it cannot really give satisfaction. But it appears I wearied of what was so delighted me at first, especially as I perceived more and more plainly that it was impossible to be constantly smart and amusing without being frequently ill-natured and too apt to turn all things, even the most serious, into mere occasions for a brilliant jest. The fairy in her heart agreed with Sylvia's conclusions, and felt pleased with herself for having thought her up, brought her up so well. But now the time was come for Sylvia to receive her gift, and all her companions were assembled. The fairy stood in the midst, and in the usual manner asked what she would take with her into the great world. Sylvia paused for a moment, and then answered, A quiet spirit. And the fairy granted her request. This lovely gift makes life constant happiness to its possessor, and to all who are brought into con contact with her. She has all the beauty of gentleness, the contentment of her sweet face, and at times it seems less lovely through some chance of grief and disquietude. The hardest thing that one ever hears said is, 
Sylvia, dear, her face is pale today. It grieves one so to see her. And when, on the contrary, she is gay and joyful, the sunshine of her presence rejoices all who have the happiness of being near her. 